Hello, hello. Uh, hello. Mr. Mr. Bell. Josh, were you on last time? You, if I recall, you were giving some really good feedback about SMP. Josh, if that's the case, you clearly didn't learn your lesson. So I have, this is just much to my amazement. All right, well, we'll have to harass Josh a little later. Okay, uh, hey, hey, welcome everybody. Um, put a, a link to the meeting minutes in the chat. If you haven't recorded your name in the agenda under attendees, please do. Reasons to do that is so that I can go, at least for my part, I can go back in history and see if I'm harassing the right person. I am, Mr. Bell. It is you. <laughs> hey, hey, Ken Owens here, having um, internet issues in my area. Well, good afternoon, Ken. It, uh, it sounds like you're having internet issues in your area. <laughs> I am. <laughs> oh, very good. Okay, well, hey, listen, we, we don't need a bunch of um, corny jokes from me like usual. We, there's a, a full agenda today, so um, we've got a number of different topics to go through. Um, um, but let's, let's, uh, let's dive in. We, we've, um, Ken Owens is here with me co-chairing the... Um, CNCF SIG network. For those that might not be familiar, um, this particular time slot is used for both uh, the Service Mesh Working Group and its initiatives, there's about four, uh, and SIG network. Um, just for those that are unaware, um, SIG network sometimes has, uh, sometimes has lots of topics. It seems to go in um, spurts and fits and sometimes not. And so instead of creating a separate time, we've been using this time for the Service Mesh Working Group. Um, those topics are somewhat light today. So it works out well, because we've got a couple of presentations. Um, without, you know, without any further ado, given the time, uh, an update on Get Nighthawk. Uh, actually, so uh, Abhishek, do you want to, do you want to brief us on transpirings from Two weeks ago? Oh, um, yes, sure. Yeah, right. Uh, hello, everybody. I will be briefing up the update on the Nighthawk. Let me share my screen. I hope my, uh, my doc is visible. Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, oh, just a second, turn and share my whole screen so that. All right. Uh, cool. Uh, so last time when we discussed, uh, we, we I talked about uh, publishing build artifacts of individual binaries as well as Docker images and setting up uh, CI in action to do so. Uh, we've been up with a prototype which can be found in this repository called get night up in which uh, I, I've, I've defined a set of github actions custom custom github actions which does the job and uh, uh, which basically right now publishes kind of uh, open to binaries which are uh, di different binaries of the nighthawk project itself, like the client server and uh, uh, the test server binaries. So I've done it for just Ubuntu right now, just for testing purposes. And it builds out fine and it publishes uh, publishes these binaries on uh, as a part of the release artifacts. Uh, but I do have a couple of questions around the night of maintainers if someone is up. Uh, the first thing is that uh, I, I want to know if there is any docker file which or before that uh, is there anyone who is 
from the Nighthawk project? So Sunku um, from Intel said that he has a conflict today. So, he, so he's okay. not here. And then Otto was positive on the progress. Otto of Red Hat was positive of the progress, but um, I don't see him on the call. All right, in that case, I'll, I'll just save it for my private conversation with them, probably. Um, so the second, the next step of discussion I wanted to make is around how we're going to automate this process. Uh, basically, right now, the we trigger this action manually by giving in a couple of parameters, like which version to be released and uh, what, 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 what architecture and etc. So how are we planning on automating this process is going to be the next discussion point of this project, I suppose. Does anyone have inputs on this? Abhishek, for my part, I missed the question. Uh, so what I was asking is that right now we have the workflow set up for publishing all these binary artifacts and Docker images of the Nighthawk builds. Uh, but currently we trigger them manually with the input parameters of version, which version of the Nighthawk to release and all those details. So how are we planning on automating this? Yeah, it's a great, got it. Will, will it be, so one option is that uh, we define a trigger in the night of projects repository itself. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a better way? I just want some inputs from you guys. I think that's a great suggestion. I, we should uh, probably raise an issue in the Nighthawk repo. Sure, yeah, take a note. Okay, well, while you're giving the time, um, while you're taking the note, the other update on the project was with respect to logo selection. And so in the March 4th meeting minutes, there's a link to um, a set of logos that were drafted and available for people to vote on. Uh, so I'm, I'm pasting that into the meeting minutes um, in, in this week's meeting minutes. Um, I haven't um, done an explicit tally but um, by count, by by the looks of it, it looks like um, image or draft logo number eight is winning out. So, so there aren't there aren't a bunch of other um, Get Nighthawk. Uh, we're we're missing other Get Nighthawk representatives on today's call. So, so but um, anyone who's on the call is welcome to um, vote on what image they might, what, what logo they might think is befitting of the project, please do. Maybe just make a comment in the meeting minutes here as to what's your favorite, what you think is the most befitting. Uh, Abhishek, any other updates? Um, no, I think that's pretty much. Uh, and I just want some inputs, maybe mainly because we are missing uh, uh, Nighthawk maintainers. I will save my questions for later. Yeah, no more updates. All right, two other items that, that we're, we've been tracking in the Service Mesh Working Group. One is um, Service Mesh Performance and, um, and it sort of congealing and being an appropriate time to propose it for um, the, the sandbox. So um, Ken and Sunku uh, and myself and all the rest of you are welcome as well. Uh, have drafted this uh, sandbox proposal. Fairly short and sweet. This is these are the questions that come from the sandbox proposal form. So, um, um, jump in and assist. Um, otherwise, we'll we'll probably tomorrow. This will probably be submitted.
good what else um along with that um meshery as the canonical implementation of smp and as the smi conformance tool um will probably be submitted alongside um it's been a long time kind of waiting for for that to come and it's probably most appropriate to submit it alongside uh service mesh performance so um and there isn't a draft uh, proposal so that needs to come together pretty quickly Okay, so for service mesh uh, working group topics, I think that's that, that's the end of it. Did any comments or questions? That's all right. Uh, SIG network. Just a, a quick reminder that uh, emissary ingress or the project formerly known as Ambassador is um, still out for public review. The last time I checked, anyway. So the, certainly they'll appreciate your feed, your support. Um, give it, give it a plus one, or give it a, a minus one if that's appropriate. And so um, for the remainder of the topics that we have, uh, two presentations. So the Submariner um, is up to present, and they're they're thinking in and around um, a donation. And then uh, the next presentation is from uh, Linkerd. Uh, that uh, is currently in the, at the incubation stage, and is um, headed toward graduation. And want to and want to get some eyeballs on, and review there. So, with that, um, of the Submariner team, welcome, folks. Um, who, who do we who do we hand off to? Hey, Lee. Uh, I can start it off, and then I'll hand off to some different team members as we go. Uh, great, so we have our slides there. Um, so Miguel's gonna be giving most of the presentation. He's a, uh, four of us are Red Hatters working on some runner here, and then Saki is um, a very active user, we're with Hitachi, who's helping us a lot to figure out stuff. Um, so we have five Submariner people, people on the call. If you have any questions, we should be able to answer it. Um, so I just wanted to tee up by yeah, mentioning that we're planning on donating some runner to the CNCF. And so we would love feedback throughout the presentation um, or asynchronously later if you think of something else. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and hand off to Miguel and then Stephen for a demo, and then we'll loop back for questions. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I was trying to <laughs> uh, unmute. I'm not very used to Zoom. Okay, so uh, Daniel, do you want to to start with the submariner donation slide? Yeah, I mean, I I mentioned it briefly, but there's um, we've okay. been working for a long time. I'll say a few more words, I guess. We've been working for quite a long time to prepare some submariner to be donated to the CNCF as far as preparing our developer infrastructure to scale and making our user experience nicer and getting all our ducks uh, in a line for intellectual property things and licensing and all that stuff. So uh, we think we're in quite good shape there. We have a document uh, linked both in the slide deck and in the agenda and can put it in chat. That's the same thing that Lee was just showing the copied questions from the Google form with our answers. Um, you're welcome to comment there too. Uh, yeah, and this is one of our last stops, at, we hope, before submitting the donation. Okay, so let me uh, explain wh what is Submariner for yeah, uh, the people on the call. Uh, so uh, the, the idea of Submariner is enabling uh, direct network connectivity, like layer three IP packets between uh, the pods and services of Kubernetes clusters. And um, it works by exposing a set of custom resources uh, in, in a Kubernetes data store. I will explain a little bit more about that. Uh, you have the, the link to the website. If you uh, want to see more details uh, on the architecture and how it works, how can it be installed. We have a few qu quick starts for different uh, types of different clouds, different Kubernetes flavors, um, and yeah, different network plugins. 
so um, yeah, and you can you can deploy Submariner in in different ways. We have an operator, we have Helm charts, and we have a command line tool that really helps you in the uh, onboarding of, of clusters to to a cluster set and um, looking into the details of, of how the connectivity is working or troubleshooting if there are issues. Um, so common use cases uh, for, for this type of connectivity can be application uh, availability, disaster recovery, uh, um, uh, data resi residency guidelines. So if your data needs to live on a specific locations uh, and, and many other use cases, I mean, it, it is really similar to service meshes, but in a more uh, simplified way in terms of, of how packets are, are handled. Um, the idea is that the, the packets uh, of the pods, when they are talking to each other or to services in other clusters, they are always handled in the Linux kernel. Um, so they don't they don't leave uh, they, they don't uh, go into any user land application uh, that needs to process the packet and and has like different latency uh, behavior compared to to the kernel. So the idea is that I mean you can maximize throughput and minimize latency or jitter in your packets. Um, so this is a, a simplified picture. If you have two clusters that your pods will be able to talk to each other, they will be able to discover each other via standard APIs that have been defined in the uh, Kubernetes uh, multi-cluster SIG. And, and we will be working in, in network policies because then that becomes increasingly important. Um, so we have a, a plan and a proof of concept for that part, but yeah, it will be developed in, in, the, in the next versions of Submariner. Um, I think I, I briefly explain, explained earlier the, the benefits of, um, of Submariner. Um, I have covered most of what we have here. Yeah, the idea is that we try to be as much as we can agnostic to the flavor of Kubernetes that it is, I mean, uh, it can be hard because we, we try to do everything on the kernel. Um, also agnostic to the network plugin that you are using. Um, but again, uh, for, for some network plugins, we will need to, to develop specific integrations as we already had to do for, for some of them. Um, and yeah, you, you can deploy services across multiple clusters and they will be, and you can uh, load balance between them and they can be discovered uh, using using a standard APIs that that have been defined in, uh, in, in Kubernetes uh, multi-cluster SIG. Um, the traffic between, between the clusters is, uh, is encrypted. Uh, we have uh, an architecture that allows different, uh, what we call cable drivers. So we have IPsec by default, but we also ha have one for WireGuard. And well, in some cases, it can be desirable that you don't want to, uh, not to have encryption because maybe your clusters are private and you want, or you need to maximize the throughput. And in those cases, we will provide an encrypted uh, cable drivers, and we are working on that. So the high level architecture of Submariner is this one. Um, we use what we call a broker to exchange information about the participating clusters or the services that have been exported to other clusters uh, and the endpoints. Uh, the endpoints that are and the, the the information about how to reach a specific cluster. So if you see, um, each, each cluster needs at least 
one gateway that it's just a, uh, one of your Kubernetes uh, nodes that you mark with the a Submariner gateway label. So that one will become your gateway. You, you can have multiple ones. Currently we do active passive failover with, you know, three, between three to 10 seconds failover. Um, but yeah, they, they become the connectivity point for other clusters. Um, so it, please feel free to stop me if you have any questions or something that's not make sense. Um, no, quick question if I could, I just, I probably missed it. I was busy um, chatting, but the, the broker, um, is this a, is it a, um, well, is it, is it a masterless broker or is it a headless? Like it, this isn't a single. Yeah. Point of yeah. Yeah. Currently. Uh, so the idea is that you, uh, it is expected that, that your broker is going to be highly available in, in the current design. Um, so, so yes, it, it will become a single point of failure that, that is correct. So it, it is expected to be highly available. Um, it, it, the only thing that you need for from the broker, at least today, is just the ability to connect to the Kubernetes API, and that will be used to exchange uh, custom resources uh, like clusters and endpoints and uh, uh, exported services, imported services. Um, so in the future, we we want to enhance this design, being able to set up multiple brokers so you can do failover if i mean even in, in the case where your broker is supposed to be highly available i mean if something goes wrong still uh, all the clusters can move to a different broker mm. also okay. yeah we have made the design in a way that even if the broker goes down um still the connectivity will i mean everything from the broker is replicated on all the participated clusters. So if the broker goes down, they still have all the information that they need to maintain connectivity and to know the services that were exported on the other clusters. Um, so, I mean, they will not be able to get information on, on new services, uh, but they will be able to work with what they had. So yeah, we have, I mean, some level of resiliency, but we want to improve that. It's a good so, question. Also on the slide, you say you label the uh, you label the individual node to be a gateway engine. Does that dedicate that node then to only being a gateway, or does it? I mean, can I run other workloads and other application pods it, it, on it, that? It can you, you can decide. I mean, uh, so okay. yeah. So you you can have a dedicated uh, node. This is a standard Kubernetes node, so it can be dedicated if you configure the tolerations to not allow other things uh, than the Submariner uh, workloads, or you can use uh, any regular uh, node. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, you can also have uh, multiple gateways labeled, so that allows uh, fast failover if uh, your gateway fails for whatever reason. Yeah, well, that, that's actually recommended. And even the idea is that you should have them in different availability zones. Um, OK. Um, I think we described this. Oh, uh, no, OK. So yeah, there is no impact to the intra-cluster traffic. So any intra-cluster traffic is not handled, and it will follow its normal path. Um, so the traffic with destination and other clusters will go through the gateway. Uh, and the idea is that we always preserve the source IP. Um, uh, also, we provide, I mean, this is complicated if your clusters have overlapping or ciders, for example, in terms of pods or, or services. So we have a special mode um, that we need to iterate into a new version, but it's working already, that we call GlobalNet. The idea of GlobalNet is that we do like a super, some sort of super cluster uh, IPAM that is going to assign 
IPs from that super cluster IP address space uh, so they can communicate um, with other clusters and be recognized and have their own IP address. That is working, but we need to iterate uh, for, yeah, uh, we have, we had a, a lot of feedback and, and we want to improve that. So, I mean, that, that is a data plane. Then we have the service discovery part, which, I mean, it, it's very important. You need to be able to reach the services on other clusters and you need a way of discovering what is the IP of those services uh, or pods. And for that, we, we use the multi-cluster service API, uh, which is now in, in, in alpha from the Kubernetes multi-cluster SIG. Um, and, and we have the, the, the concept of, of cluster set, uh, which means that uh, a cluster set is, is a group of clusters uh, that have a, like a high degree of, of mutual trust normally administrated by the same um, people. And we uh, and it is assumed that uh, the namespaces in, in different clusters are supposed to belong to the same project. It's a, like a base assumption on this multi-cluster service API. Uh, so yeah, it, it means that if you are exporting one service in a, in a namespace in one cluster and you export the same service on the same namespace in a different cluster, it means that it is the same service. And you can reach either cluster A or cluster B, and it should not matter. Um, so yeah, it, this is like a foundation of, of the multi-cluster service API. And in this API, we have uh, we have two core uh, objects. One is the service export and the other is the service import. A service export is something that uh, you have to create to, to declare, OK, I want to export my service. And, and when you do that, in the other clusters, it will be available in this format. Then we have more formats for headless services or, yeah, or, or stateful sets, uh, because you need to address individual pods. Uh, but this is the most simple one. And, and then the service import is something that you will find in your cluster if uh, another cluster has exported a service and then um, this is, I mean, your, your cluster has discovered that service. It's part of this replication that I explained at the start that if the broker goes down, still you will have the service import and you will be able to resolve and connect. Yeah, this is the lighthouse uh, architecture. We, we use, uh, it's basically core DNS with a plugin uh, that is going to use those service imports um, to, to resolve those DNS uh, requests. So um, you, you need to introduce a, a hop in your Q, uh, DNS or, or core, existing core DNS to, to send the service cluster set local to go via our service. Uh, we handle that automatically in the operator. And yeah, this is our command line install tool. So this is like the minimal install for two clusters. Uh, you deploy a broker in one cluster, and then you can join two clusters. I mean, you, you could even join the broker also if you wanted. Uh, so you can join those clusters with this uh, uh, file, which is generated, which allows uh, Safcatel to to create credentials for the new cluster and then connect it to the broker and deploy some more layer. Um, so yeah, we, we wanted to explain how we think that Submariner fits in, in the multi-cluster ecosystem versus that we try to be network plugin agnostic. So you can have one cluster with one network plugin and another cluster with a different one. So far we test with uh, with uh, Flannel, um, 
with OpenShift SDN run in the side of Red Hat, also with OBN Kubernetes. And uh, we know that some people is, is also using it with Calico. Um, yeah, so far, those are the ones that we have under control. Also, yeah, the, the uh, GKE uh, network plugin also works. Um, so yeah, that is one part then that we 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 have been working with the Kubernetes multi-cluster seek to define the 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 this those APIs. Um, uh, yeah, they, they are implementing in in uh, in Google, and yes, we started implementing them uh, for Submariner, trying to be to make something super agnostic. And hopefully there will be more people implementing this API. Um, another point is that uh, existing service messages could build on top of Submariner. Um, the idea is that we provide the, the IP connectivity and then the service mesh wouldn't really need to create any uh, endpoints or connectivity and just use that. And yeah, it's time for, for a small demo. I will stop sharing. Yeah, so I'll be doing the demo. I'm just uh, looking for the right window. Uh, right, so somebody was asking um, in the chat uh, how the the root agent was uh, set up on the uh, daemon sets. Um, so in the demo, we've got, uh, let me show you, uh, we've got three clusters set up, um, one running on GKE and two running OpenShift on AWS. Uh, and so Miguel mentioned um, that the broker uses a number of CRDs to do its work. And basically, that's all it is. There's no code running in the broker cluster for some reiner. It's just data storage. Uh, and so the first one is cluster here. And that lists all the clusters that have been joined uh, in the cluster set. And once OpenShift loads the information, we'll be able to see. There we have three, so like I said, GKE, uh, OCPA, and OCPB. Um, and on on those clusters, we've set up, uh, well, Miguel set up a rocket chat. So uh, if you want to go and play, I'll paste the links. Uh, uh, yeah, let, let me do it, unless you have them super ready. Right, OK, yeah, go for it. Um, and so while, while Miguel's pasting uh, the links in, I can continue showing more of the CRDs, perhaps. Um, so that was the clusters one, which gives the list of clusters, basically. There's not all that much information in there. Uh, and then the, the, um, the different clusters, they connect using endpoints. And so these are shown here. Uh, and this gives details of the actual um, IP addresses to use to, to connect to the, uh, the other clusters um, and the, the back end that's being used and the subnets uh, that are managed. Um, so that's that's really how the connectivity uh, appears from the administrator's point of view. Um, services, so they use the the MCS um, CRDs. Well, you'll see actually in the list here, uh, we've got our own uh, legacy ones as well, uh, but we've migrated over to the multi-cluster. So see here, service export in two versions, Lighthouse and multi-cluster.xcates. Uh, and this isn't the exporting cluster, so we won't see anything in service export, but we will see in service imports that we have uh, a MongoDB 
service that's been exported here, or uh, imported, sorry. Um, there we have it. So Rocket Chat Mongo in the default namespace. And so this would, this, like Miguel said, um, means that from all of our, all of the clusters that have imported the, the service, which is all of the clusters in the cluster set, um, you can look up rocket chat slash mongo dot default dot svc dot cluster set dot local um, and you'll get one of the services that's accessible across the, the cluster set. Um, so I can just demonstrate that quickly. Uh, I have a Netshoot pod handy. Um, and so here, the because this cluster isn't running, um, the service itself uh, will get a different, uh, well, we'll get a, a service in, in, the, in one of the uh, other cluster sets. But we have, uh, we do prefer the local cluster if we can. So if the service is running on multiple clusters in the cluster set and uh, you query the service from a Oh, it's it's uh, it's, oh, a it's a headless one. service. Yeah, no, it's a oh, it's a service. headless one. This one, yeah. Okay, so I'll I'll set up another one just for the, just so that we can illustrate. Um, so I'll start nginx. Um, give me a second. So yeah, like I was saying, um, we. We uh, prefer the the local cluster. So if you have you have a service that's set up on multiple clusters, uh, you'll get the local one back. Um, if you query from a cluster that's not got the um, service at all locally, then you'll get. Um, Stephanie, uh, do you have a, a different window? We don't see it, or it just got stuck. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, I'm just okay. running a I'm just deploying nginx demo right now. So this should appear. Uh, so we'll go back to the cluster, the CRDs. Yeah. So if you have the service available across multiple clusters, then you'll get it back uh, in the round robin fashion. And this is a bit different to, for instance, if you've played with this on using the same MTS API on GKE, that relies on cluster set IPs where the same IP address uh, will lead to different instances. We rely on DNS round robin. That's perhaps the most significant difference in MCS API implementations, as far as I'm aware. Right, so we have here Nginx demo now, uh, which is available. And so if I go back to my pod. So, so you created that service on, on cluster B and you exported it. So yep. it's now imported here. Okay. That's right, yeah. So now if I do, Dig nginx demo default svc cluster set dot local. Right, this time it finds it and it can even talk to it. There. Yeah, and so I should have tried that before deploying it so that you, so that it was obvious that I wasn't cheating. But uh, <laughs> um, and so this one here, it's on a, a different. Um, different cluster has been exported, but I can show also uh, running it on the same cluster. So I'll just get Nginx set up here on cluster A as well. So we just need to wait for it to, to come up. That's it. So now we have it on the local cluster as well, and it's going to prefer that one always. Um, so that's from the deployment perspective. For administrator uh, purposes, we also have a number of metrics that are published. Um, and these get, if you're running on OpenShift, these get set up automatically. Uh, so for example, we have, we track the number of, uh, the, the amount of traffic that goes over the various connections. So here I'm on cluster, uh, OCP cluster A connected to OCP cluster B and the GKE cluster. And so because um, the MongoDB database is on uh, GKE, 
then I would expect most of the traffic to occur between OCPA and GKE and not much traffic to B. And so that's what we see here. Uh, the blue line is goes to GKE. Um, you can see that in the labels here, remote cluster GKE, and then very little going to B at all. Um, we have a number of other metrics like uh, just the number of gateways that are connected. Um, sorry. Uh, so that's just one. Uh, this is on the number of gateways that are set up on the local cluster. Um, the number of connections as well with their state. And so here we're showing two to the two different clusters. Um, uh, what else do we have? Uh, the latency, that's an interesting one. So we track uh, the latency to the different clusters that each cluster is connected to. Uh, and so as you'd expect, the other AWS cluster has very low latency. And the GK one, since it's further away, has higher latency, but they're both pretty stable. Uh, and we also track, so if we had a global net, which isn't the case here, uh, we have some global net metrics because uh, because we have a big pool of addresses that are used, um, you obviously need to pay attention to the amount that's actually being used. Uh, so we keep track of, track of that and export, uh, export it as a metric. And we also track the number of uh, all oh, right, no, that's in the next version. We'll have uh, uh, service discovery metrics as well, but uh, not yet. <laughs> um, so I think that's about it for the for what I had to demonstrate. Nice, right, perfect timing. We also have quite a few good questions in chat that I was just scrolling through. I think Lee has at least like three or four good ones queued up here. And um, if we can't get to them all, that you know, then. Um my curiosity will wait <laughs> but yeah, yeah. One, one or two of them if you if you guys care to pick one or two uh right yeah so yeah i like the question about um incorporating it into kubernetes <laughs> so that's that's piqued my uh interest i'm wondering what it would take but that's probably a bigger discussion very good and mm. um not a not a suggestive question per se, but just yeah, a, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah we haven't. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you take it, Miguel. Yeah, I was going to say that I don't know if I see the all the questions because, yeah, I. Yeah, I was about to start on. repeating them. There, there was uh, one about brownfield for globalnet. Um, can we step into a brownfield and set up globalnet? Revolving cider support. Uh, yes. So by Brentfield, I mean I take it you mean uh, a bunch of clusters that have overlapping ciders already. Uh, yeah. If you know that from the start, then Submariner can you can set up Submariner from the beginning with Global Net, uh, and it will work fine. The what we don't support yet is if you set up Submariner without Global Net and then you try to join a cluster that has an overlapping cider, uh, that won't work. We can't add Global Net post facto once Submariner has been set up. Uh, but it's easy enough to just redeploy Submariner uh, when that happens. Um, good. I've got a good, good, good. There's a, there's a bunch of, uh, this is a great, fantastic presentation, guys. Um, I've got a, I've got questions that are last us the next hour. Um, uh, just, you know, for what, I, for, hey, it's really fun sitting on this side of the table, you know, hammering you with questions, pelting you with questions. It's uh, no, 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 that's, that's great. I yeah, mean, because questions, yeah, uh, yeah will, I mean, will give us information about what are we missing or where are we not doing a, a great job? Yeah. So the, the last question, that is a, a quite an important one, I think. Uh, do all, does all in their cluster internode traffic transit the cable driver to? And the answer is no. Uh, inner cluster traffic just uses the normal uh, Kubernetes networking layer. It doesn't go through the gateway. It's only 
only uh, inter-cluster traffic that goes through the, the tunnels. Uh, what does root agent upgrade look like in terms of disruption to active intercluster communication by pods on the node? Um, Shridhar, you might want to build that one, perhaps. Yeah, so basically like a route agent runs as a daemon set and it programs some routing rules and some creates some VX submarine and tunnel interfaces. So when you're upgrading, uh, depending on like uh, for both version we're uh, upgrading, we generally don't modify the configuration until and unless it's required. So ideally, you, we should be, I mean, we may not expect any disruption to the intercluster traffic unless we are really modifying some configuration on the respective host. Yeah, and on everywhere as much as we can, uh, we we try to leave the data plane work configured and working. So if you bring the the pods down, or if you are updating them to a newer version, that the plane will will remain while that is happening. So, it yeah, we we don't expect disruption. Um, we I mean, we, we test for failovers and we test for hammering the road agents. We have a, a pretty big set of end-to-end -end tests that we we keep improving them uh, with with new ideas. Um, yeah, and that is something that we test, but we don't test, for example, if there are, if there is a small time with packet drops, for example, I think that would be interesting to test. All right, let me just jump in. I think we need to hand it off to our seniors, Nico D, for their graduation proposal at this point. Thank you all for the wonderful questions, though. Thank you, guys. That was, it was great. Uh, uh, Mr. Morgan, and Linkerd is up for um, graduation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so, yep, we're up for graduation. Linkerd has actually been, uh, you know, it, I think it was the fifth ever project accepted into the CNCF. Uh, before there was a, a, a uh, sandbox phase, even back when it was called incub incubation, inception, back when it was called inception. Um, so I have a couple slides that I can run through, um, kind of giving an overview of the project and adoption. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, honestly, I'm also here to just answer questions. So, you know, I think part of the graduation process is having uh, the CNCF SIG network review the proposal. So if there's anything I can provide that would be helpful for those purposes, then like here I am ready to provide it and obviously offline as well. So uh, you want me to do a quick overview or is there anything uh, you want to dive into specifically? Uh, I'll, throw, I'll throw you off just with the, and, and this, this might be an offline. This is, um, this is like a half comment, half question that, um, that again, like it's really easy to sit on this side of the table and ask the question, you know, like, um, and that, well, or let me start by saying, um, do you want to, do you want to, <laughs> oh, William, oh, William. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> what have I done? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, hmm. the, I, let me just make a statement and say the um, kudos on the establishment of a steering committee, um, just as the project uh, matures in functionality and matures in governance, matures in um, adoption and, and being used in ways that you didn't imagine, I suspect, um, you know, what a, what a self-directed, self-initiated, um, healthy, you know, uh, healthy step. I was, uh, thanks for having thanks. me the first, uh, yeah, the, the, it was, it was, um, um, yeah, or I mean, you know, yeah, anyway, <laughs> and then, uh, uh, the, yeah, and then um, I'll follow up with um, with other with with um, comments. And boy, I made it sound super anonymous, on, and uh, and it's not. And so, uh, yeah, William, if you take us through a couple of slides, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, let's see. Can you see a giant Linkerd logo somewhere? Yeah. Yes. All right. That's good because I cannot. Where is it? It's like disappeared from my view. Hold on. 
Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, so yeah, I'll just give you a very brief rundown. Um, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot to say. Um, but uh, uh, Linkerd is a service mesh. Uh, we have a very strong focus on being light and fast and security centric. Um, and at this point, um, you know, we've been in production for over four years at companies around the world. Um, we've gone through a bunch of iterations on the project internally. Uh, have a very healthy community in the Slack channel, um, uh, primarily, uh, and uh, a whole lot of GitHub stars and, and things like that, over 200 contributors. So I just counted uh, up to 200 uh, and doing uh, a near weekly edge releases. So we try and get code out you know, in front of uh, early adopters as rapidly as possible. Um, and of course we have open governance and um, you know, a neutral home in the CNCF. These are some of the logos that are currently using Linkerd. Some of them I know a lot about because they've told us a lot. Some of them uh, I don't know anything about because we only know kind of uh, through external evidence that they're using Linkerd and they don't want to talk to us. So it's always part of the, the fun of, of open source. Um, okay, so what does Linkerd do? I think this is very similar to you know what every service mesh does. There's kind of three big categories, set of features around observability, set of features around reliability, set of features around security. Um, for Linkerd, you know, our, our goal is to deliver those features to you in a way that uh, minimizes the operational pain associated with that. So we, we believe that the service mesh doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, it can be pretty simple to operate. It's not a trivial piece of technology, but the operational component can be simple. And we do a lot of stuff uh, in our design to reduce that operational overhead. And that's kind of the primary driver. Um, and I think also, you know, part of what makes Linkerd a little unique in the service mesh space. Um, I won't go too much into this, but, you know, I think the value of the service mesh, you know, is not really the features that it brings, but it's in the fact that it delivers those features at the platform level. These are features that historically we've had to get in the application, even though they are effectively platform features. So the real audience of Linkerd are the SREs, the platform owners, you know, the folks who are operating Kubernetes. The developers are much less exposed. And ideally, you know, they're often not exposed at all to the service mesh. So what the service mesh is giving you, what Linkerd is really solving for you, you know, it's not really giving you retries. It's giving you retries in a way where you can get that at the platform level and you don't have to beg the developers to do that. Same thing with MTLS. Okay, let's talk a little bit about kind of our design philosophy. So we're really trying to, uh, you know, follow this idea of minimalism and do, you know, just the bare minimum to give you a secure uh, and operationally simple service mesh. Um, so Linkerd out of the, uh, the goal is uh, it should work. If you have a functioning Kubernetes application and you add Linkerd to it, the application should continue functioning. We can do that in almost every case. Um, and it took quite a feat of engineering to get there, um, but that's a, a really uh, strong belief for us. Um, Ultralight, of course, bare minimum uh, resource cost um, and, and latency as well. Of course, the service mesh works with lots of user space proxies. So you're gonna pay a cost. Um, we try and minimize that cost as much as possible. Make it simple. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. Uh, and then security first. So whenever possible, we want security to be the default setting, uh, not a thing that you have to configure, not a thing that you have to enable later. So control plane written in Go, uh, it's sitting around 200 megs of RSS. Um, it can optionally correct, collect metrics data, in which case like you can use a lot of memory depending on how much data you're collecting. Um, data plane uh, are these little Rust-based uh, proxies. We call them micro proxies because they actually are very different from something like Envoy uh, or Nginx. Um, and uh, I've written a lot over the years about Linkerd. Uh, there's a historical article here you can read on InfoQ. We actually started out with a JVM-based Linkerd written in Scala uh, and went through a pretty big rewrite, you know, starting in 2018. Um, to get to this uh, Go and Rust combo. Um, okay, I've got like one, two more slides maybe, uh, and then I'll be done with the whirlwind tour. So like most service meshes, you know, there's a set of control plane components that sit off uh, to the side. And then the magic is in these little micro proxies that we inject inside the pods and we do the transparent uh, wiring so that all TCP communication goes through those pods. 
which means that whenever service A talks to service B, or uh, you know, instance A talks to instance B, it's going through two, not one, but two proxies. Um, so that means those proxies have to be very, very fast. And it means you're gonna have a lot of them, so they need to be very, very small. Uh, so Linkerd uses this uh, micro proxy, which is called simply Linkerd2 proxy. It's not really a general purpose thing. It's very tightly coupled to Linkerd itself. Uh, it's built on top of this amazing Rust ecosystem, Rust network library ecosystem, which is general purpose. You know, and I believe this is probably one of the most advanced, technologically advanced projects in the entire CNTF landscape because we are sitting right on top of this very, very fast moving uh, and very exciting Rust asynchronous network uh, ecosystem. Um, choice of Rust lets us avoid an entire class of memory vulnerabilities. We won't get too much into that, but like that's really nice since what's going through this data plane is like customer's health information and PII and, and so on. Uh, we can compile down to native code. Uh, we do regular third-party security audits, which we pass, thankfully. Um, and like I said, very, a uh, modern networking stack, Linkerd2 proxy, part of Linkerd project. So it's open source, it's audited, it's up on GitHub, um, but a pretty different approach from uh, the general purpose proxy. So uh, we, uh, you know, the goal for us is you should not have to become an expert, an operational expert in Linkerd2 proxy, right? You should become an operational expert in Linkerd, but the proxy should as much as possible be an implementation detail. Lots more to say about that. Um, and we have a security philosophy as well, but I'm going to stop here. I see there's a couple of questions and we're coming up to time. So I'll stop the presentation here and start working through some of these questions. Which uh, I will access by pressing a few buttons. Okay. Ah, pluggable ingress. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think um, I missed. I, I might have misread that. I, uh... Yeah, so right now, right, it's not, we don't have our own ingress. We work with every other ingress that we can possibly work with. So that's part of our philosophy of keeping this as minimalist as possible. There are many, many good ingress controllers out there that have a huge feature set, none of which I want to implement and none of which are like service mesh specific. Um, so yeah, we work with that. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it totally does. I uh, actually, it makes. I mean, that's a great philosophy. I mean, it's it's a winning. I don't know. You you, you need my commentary on that. Like, uh, but but I'll give it anyway. Yeah, it's it's a winning philosophy. I mean, um, there are the, the vast majority of um, projects and individuals, I think, tend to make the other choice. Which, so this is refreshing. Like, I think actually, it's I yeah. I, you know, I think. It, I think it's, we naturally want to accumulate more things, right? We naturally want to make the project do more and more and solve more problems. And it takes a certain amount of like discipline to go in the opposite direction. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, um, yeah, it's a sign of strength, actually, I think. Um, actually, and I, I misinterpreted it just when I initially saw it thinking, oh, that um, perhaps um, Linkerd's micro proxy is pluggable itself or has a extension points or is pluggable itself and and um and that's that's not currently the case um, no no in fact we ignored that entire you know we had some ideas about making it you know proxy agnostic and stuff sorry where's my proxy slide here just uh, making it agnostic and it just it didn't solve a problem it well, didn't allow us to solve a problem that we really wanted to solve yeah, totally. Actually, I think I misphrased that as well. Um, rather, um, Linkerd's micro proxy doesn't have pluggable filters. Are you, um... Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're talking about things like WASM, that is on the tentative roadmap, because I think there is value to that, um, but we have not tackled that yet. We did something like that in the 1.x days when we were on the JVM. You know, we had this idea of plugins. It was cool because people could extend, you know, Linkerd do all sorts of application specific stuff, but operationally it became very complicated very rapidly. So there's a little, uh, there, there's some friction to that idea currently on the, on the team, but not, not necessarily forever. Sure. Well, again, like some, some, just some general comments, like, Hey, in every, like you, in, in accordance with um, graduation criteria and and even not being 
from, you know, even if you're not familiar with what the specifics of that criteria is, I mean, in every which, you know, in every which way, um, Linkerd V2, just, you know, he hits those out of the park. Um, the With one the exception, one big exception, one major exception, which is we only have maintainers today from one organization. Yeah, that was what I was going to broach before. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, so this is going to be interesting. Yeah, um, there is... Uh, Yep. Um, one of the, but in the other way, yeah, that was what I was going to mention. The other, in the other ways, um, the fact that it is a V2, the fact you've taken learnings from your, your V1, it's almost a sign. If you look at some of the other projects in the space, and not just this space, but the cloud native space, um, it's a large or significant sign of maturity of the set of knowledge and um, to have to, to do a re-architecture, to like have taken all those learnings from all the like what a significant um, benefit that is to any of the users of the project. And the fact that it's, um, you know, the fact that you, you, the project itself and, and the principles by which it's being designed are, um, are in like that strength that you were just talking about, about avoiding, like acknowledging that there's other ingresses to use and not reinventing that particular wheel. Is it also, um, you know, are identifying general purpose things versus purpose built things and, and um, you know, identifying just a few ultra fast, ultra light, you know, just uh, Kubernetes, uh, native Kubernetes first, like uh, hanging on to a few of those um, design principles um, throughout, you know, throughout V2s, you know, from, from conduit to, to now. Um, well, you know, makes it for anyone who pays it pays attention and can sort of reviews those those different projects. It becomes um, quite clear that this how those manifest in, in terms of a user experience, in terms of um, uh, well, in terms of a lot of things like time to value and um, there's um, some amount of boringness is good uh, and the simplicity facilitates some, some boringness, if, if you will. I think boring is the wrong, has a negative connotation, but rather stable is the, is more of the appropriate. Unsurprising. Connotation. Yeah. On that, this is my, my last question. I know we're five minutes over. And so um, re reflections for you um, as you, well, yeah, as you balance, like we were just talking about Wasm and, and it being, um, hot and interesting and yet um you know from prior experience you know friction and, and also you know ex it, you know expands the scope of the the scope of work to be done all these things like do you thought your thoughts on how to balance um as as you as linkerd faces graduation goes to have stable as a con you know as a connotation associated with graduation and stable associated with um the project what, what, how do you balance between the you know, innovative things and, and uh, being boring? Yeah, we have a really strong opinion here. And it's like, it's something that took a while for us to develop, but we are extremely user focused. We spend as much time with our users as we can. We look at the things that are causing them pain. And what you realize is like 95 plus percent of the time, it's not like I don't have, you know, a data plane plugin, you know, with WASM. It's like I'm running out of, you know, space in Prometheus because it just takes all these metrics and I have no idea how to control that. It's like, that's the stuff that actually causes pain for people. And I think being a hyper-focused on that and, you know, trying to map that to a concrete thing you can do in as short a time as possible is the one skill that we've I mean, still working on it, but really trying hard uh, the, the, and that we've relied on to guide our, our feature choice, just being hyper-focused on, on like the actual pain that people are having. And I think if you do that, then like a lot of the, a lot of the noise starts falling away and you're like, oh, here's the thing. It's not super cool, but this is actually what's causing human beings problems. Uh, questions or comments from anyone else for, for William?
<clears throat> my apologies on the um, on the um, overshot on time. Um, great presentations today. Just, you know, uh, for my part, I really appreciate people fielding the fielding them. So, um, all right, very good. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. That's the that's a wrap. All right. Thanks for having yeah. me. Thank you very much. Thanks for everybody. Thanks for having us. Amazing presentation. Likewise. <laughs>